Please stand as we sing our last song, hymn 526, Because He Lives. like to welcome everybody to uh, Niles Westside this morning. I don't know, but a show of hands, how many people this is the favorite time of year? <laughs> Somebody other than myself, I'm sure. There's something reassuring about springtime. Um, I absolutely love seeing the little gr green sprouts. I know um, I drive a lot on my job, and, and um, I, I know I call Carol the first time I see stuff starting to sprout, and the little green leaves starting to show up in the undergrowth. It's just a great sign. And I know on the way to church this morning, we saw, I don't know how many flocks of turkeys putting on their full display. It's that time of year. There's just so many things that happen every year. Gives us great faith that our God is control. Amen. And year after year, season after season, he's always present there. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the fact that you are in control of the world, of nature, of all the universe, Lord. You are our God and our creator, and for that we will be forever grateful. Pray that you will send your spirit and bless this service today. We ask these things in thy name, amen. amen. Uh, the offering today is for student aid, and I don't know how many people have attended our schools, most of us, great numbers have been through the school system. It's a wonderful thing to be um, involved in that type of environment. We're tremendously blessed having our school here. Um, on our own grounds, I guess it's out that direction. Um, that it's a wonderful outreach. I believe it's probably the strongest mission that our church can undertake is supporting that school, um, as well as the academy and the university. And the loose offering today is going towards student aid. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a great joy to be back. It was great to. Uh, do the mission work as we went to El Salvador, and uh, today is going to be uh, the time when I will report on our mission. But before that, I'd like to have a couple of announcements done that um, uh, today, and I'm quite biased for that announcement because it's today um, AU 
Easter musical where students are going to uh, celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in their play at 6 o'clock today at PMC and also tomorrow at 6 p.m. at PMC uh, and my daughter plays a part in that and that's why I'm so biased in this announcement. So anyway, uh, but there's going to be also a ministry, um, uh, women's ministry brunch, uh, Sunday, April 7 at 9 a.m. And uh, also Frank and Brooklyn Cole, they are very thankful for your prayers as they went through some health challenges. Now also kindergarten open house, April 9th at 6 p.m. Please let your uh, friends know about that. And the uh, NAS Academic Showcase on Thursday, April 11th. So um, now going into the mission trip report. Uh, we uh, arrived at different times, but I'd like to tell you how big our group was. Uh, let, me see, let me get close so I could see uh, this screen. So uh, we had 170 people from Michigan Conference Plus, some other conferences going to this trip, and also 80 people joined us from Indiana Conference altogether. 250 people, it was a large group, and feeding that group was something else, and uh, I praise God that our team was responding to that very well. Of course, every trip has uh, its challenges, but by God's grace, we made it back home. But this is like when, uh, uh, it looked like when we were loading to get on the trip, okay? So, and uh, we, it was deep at night, some of us were trying to catch a sleep in the airport, and this is when we arrived to San Salvador Airport in El Salvador, and it was a great blessing to uh, spend some time uh, there as we were welcomed by the school. It was very warm, uh, warm uh, welcome, and uh, it was our first orientation. Uh, they have a great pavilion, by the way, uh, just the accomplished building that, uh, where that's where the students usually um, uh, eating. It's an eating area for them and we enjoyed that new building um, as well. Now, that's how the food, some of it was cooked. Do you see that? It's a huge, it's a huge bowl there where they would uh, boil uh, food and they would prepare food. There's some cooks over there on action. You know, that's how fruit looks there. And doing a little bit of advertisement there for the mission trips, okay? Because there's no other fruit tastes like there in those countries. They really taste uh, great. Uh, now, but you've got to wash them first, okay? Very important. Uh, now, this is how the <laughs> building site looked like. And uh, the, uh, the, the first day we arrived, it was a lot of blocks inside the building, and we knew they were supposed to be on the walls as we uh, leave. Every, uh, every day we started with a worship prayer, uh, uh, with a worship service, and we ended with a worship service. And every worship service started with prayer, and it ended with prayer. It was a lot of prayer. It was a lot of success in that trip. Uh, now, yeah, very important feature in the mission trip, just showing you, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, the first, from the get-go, uh, the mortar mixer, uh, it was uh, not starting. We couldn't find out why it wouldn't start, and then we found out because they gave us a diesel fuel for gasoline equipment. You know, that, well, it took us a little while to find that out, but we solved that. And as soon as we figured that out, the work has started. We were laying block 100 plus weather, scorching sun, and we were laying uh, blocks over there. It was something else, but uh, very important to take some breaks like that, you know, so uh, take some time off. DOT, regular DOT regulation, okay? That's uh, some sugar cane. Over, they are always overloading their trucks with that. I um, really, um, uh, really enjoyed seeing different sites. We had different teams. The paint crew was painting the newly built Orly Ford University. Uh, the masonry crew, they were building uh, the building that was next to cafeteria. And also we had, um, yeah, there's Susan over there. She was part of a, a painting crew. And uh, uh, now we also had VBS crew. We also had landscaping crew. And if I forgot any crews, uh, uh, you know, please uh, forgive me for that. 250 people, they had to do something, right? 
So first Friday there, we had a dedication of this center. It was a medical, it, it is a medical center. It was built in 1998, but for a decade and a half, it was abandoned. Nothing was happening there. And it became kind of a, a place where bats would dwell. Uh, but uh, finally, Union, El Salvador Union, was able to claim ownership of this building. And they did complete rebuild of it. And this is when we had a dedication prayer. Now, one of the doctors that was invited, the local doctors that was invited for that event, for the opening of that uh, center, uh, she used to be an Adventist when she was growing up, but later on she left the church, and then she came for the dedication. She walked around the campus. She saw what was happening on the campus. She saw a lot of students uh, working there on a, a side building, laying block, and she asked, is this part of their teaching curricula that they came and they do missions? Do they take a mission class? And uh, we said no. It was their desire to come and dedicate their Spring, uh, uh, spring break vacation to do some mission work. And she couldn't believe it. She started crying and she was saying, you know, at this time they could use it to go somewhere at the shore and get an even tan. Instead, they were getting uh, their necks burned, their arms burned in the sun over there. They were building uh, that uh, center. And this is what she said. Not everything then is lost for our church. That's what she said. I hope God would use that event to bring her closer to the uh, re to relationships with God. The next day on Sabbath, we had a dedication of Orly Ford University, and uh, uh, 2,500 people attended that event. The kitchen was very busy to feed all of these people, and it was also a great event. And uh, that's a union president for El Salvador. He um, shared from the Word of God there, and also Elder Denslow, uh, the union president from a lake, um, um, Great Lakes uh, uh, Union, and he uh, did a dedication prayer. It was a great time to spend together. Uh, you see the picture of Petty Office in the center. She is in charge of a program that raises money for kids to go into that school. And two kids that stand next to her, next to her are the kids uh, that have lost their parents due to gang activities in the past. It was a very, um, uh, very interesting story to hear how God has blessed them when they came to the uh, uh, to place like Echos and received their education. They found Jesus as their savior in the school. Uh, they still had about 13 students that needed the scholarship. By the time, uh, by the end of that meeting, all of them have been picked up. Praise the Lord. Now, we had one day there dedicated for, let's say, vacation. And uh, we uh, had a travel to waterfalls. And unfortunately for Susan, this is when her fall uh, took place. She uh, tore some ligaments in her knee. So please pray for her soon recovery. Later on, she also had another injury on her ankle. Uh, yet, definitely, uh, she definitely would appreciate your prayers and soon recovery. And and uh, she was not the only one. Oh, by the way, that's fish tickling your feet over there in that area. And another person, Keith Mattingly, if you know him, he went into that on, on that trip as well. He also took a fall and uh, had a wound, open wound there that he was treated there right on the spot. He said, there are two doctors over here treating my wound. I feel taken care of. That was good. That's how fruit looks over there. Another advertisement, right? Okay. One more picture, all right? May, maybe I'll convince you to go to a mission trip next time. I don't know. All right, so we had some worship services there. Um, as I said, every time uh, you might ask, what's different, what's so special about uh, that picture? Why are they laughing, okay? Just check it out, okay? Look at that. Okay, look at this. Look at that, all right? So, my dad and this guy, uh, Chris uh, Bakioke, he, Chris is seven foot tall, you know. Um, uh, when it comes to my dad and I, we are much shorter, right? Yeah, so, uh, but he was on our masonry crew. And I don't know if you're familiar with building. Uh, the blocks, you got to get and take that uh, block over the rebar and then slide it down into the place. 
and he was our crane, okay? So we were a good team together. All right, so that's uh, Susan. And by the way, I'd like to say that accidents happen anywhere, here in El Salvador, but what's the most important is how we respond uh, to the accident. And I am so proud of all of our team of missionaries. They uh, helped out Susan in her injury. They covered her with care all the time. That's our Mason's team. And this is some of our uh, people uh, laying lock over there. Alex, I don't know if he's here uh, somewhere. Oh, yeah, he's out, outside there. Yeah, and of course, it's important to take some rest, okay? Hammock time, it was a must time. There we go. All right, and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, more of our people. And this is uh, uh, Dr. Peritza Zaninovich. She was a dental doctor, and she operated in that uh, clinic that we just dedicated there. It was uh, freshly rebuilt, and it was good conditions to work with. I would say better than before. That's what I would say. And there's some uh, medical team there. Uh, Susan was part of that as well. And uh, this VBS crew that was uh, doing some work with the children. And this is in, in other regulations, the driving regulations there. But by the way, once that photo became popular, the people on that tractor got punished. No longer we had seen that happening, okay? So they had a local pool there. We could uh, swim there maybe twice, uh, uh, but it was good time. And somebody decided to play soccer, 100 degrees plus weather. Oh, and they did it. It was not hot enough for them. Now, the next, uh, like the second Sabbath, uh, we had a special trip there uh, to dedicate four different churches. And I will show you some pictures of what those churches look like. We are in one of, that, uh, in, of those uh, churches uh, that basically looks like this. It has a window opening and a door opening. Do you see any windows and doors? You know what? But people are happy. They are so joyful. They sing praise God, hallelujah, because they know that they didn't have that before. They know how to be content. My friends, we are overly blessed here, and we ought to appreciate what we have. Amen? Amen. All right, so I um, also had a dedication prayer for that building. This is the last Sabbath there. It's uh, um, our Michigan Plus, I would say, group of missionaries together. And we had the last night a uh, uh, show, uh, talent, uh, kind of a, a talent show there, presentation. And that group had a lot of great talent. That's how the place looked once we were done, once we left there. So the walls are up, not only external walls, but internal walls. There has to be some other work done on the walls. And then the roof will, uh, will be put over and some other work will be done. Uh, this is pastor of the Stevensville Church, Bryce Bowman. We are good friends with him, but these trips help you bond with the people even better, even closer. These are two of his uh, brothers. They are twins, you know. Uh, by the end of the trip, I could tell them apart. You know, it was quite a challenge, but I learned that. Then finally, last but not the least, this is the site of a church that we have raised money for. We were raising this money. We made a call, and by God's grace, we were able to raise $10,000 towards the material to build this church. They did not know that we have completed our process. They simply had our promise that we will raise this money and will send them over to them they dag the footings by faith without knowing that we have completed uh, the fundraising and they have the money. Praise the Lord for that. This is their group. They are so energetic. And I asked them, how long do you think it will take you to build this uh, uh, church over here? And they said, well, uh, two months. I said, two months? They said, yeah, well, maybe three. Maybe three months. I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, and, and they will send us report how the progress goes. Now, um, you probably remember I mentioned to you about that boy that was uh, paralyzed, and they asked for the wheelchair. We fundraised uh, the money for that as well. We gave them the money on Sunday, and on Monday they sent us the picture. They've got the chair ready for this boy. So it was time for us to leave. It was a uh, um, nice uh, trip, but I'm telling you, I was happy to go home. Yeah, 
In my future sermons, you will hear more stories about that trip for sure. Probably not today as much, but it was a wonderful experience. I encourage everyone to participate in missions. So we praise God for the trip, and we thank you so much for generosity that this has happened. Amen. You need a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right, boys and girls, I know what you're thinking. You want to rush right up here because you've seen this guy before and thinking he's easily one of the top 10 storytellers here at Niles. <laughs> Ooh, I heard top 20, I'll take it. <laughs> so I want you to look around, don't run, but just stroll because you might see somebody with some money around that's your job to get that money to bring it up. And if you're looking and if you're not seeing any money being fluttered around, I, I found uninterrupted eye contact can often help. And we have a large center lane here. But I want some smart kids to look at the sides here and see if they can't uh, find anything over on the sides. So come on up. You guys did good. So before I start my story, I want to let you in on a little secret, okay? Usually when I get ready for a story, I just take one of Pastor Dwight's stories. I change a detail or two and just pass it off as my own. But I think he's behind me, so we're going to have to switch things up a little bit. You know what? Just right there. All right. So uh, we're going to go off script then, and we're going to look at... Um, something. Can you guys see the screen way back there? I'm going to show you a picture on there. I want you to think about, do you think you know what the longest insect in the world is? You think you know? Let's hear it. Is that right? A stringed instrument. You think you know? Oh, I've seen centipedes. They get pretty big, don't they? What do you think? A snake? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, look, I got a picture here. This is what I saw on the internet, and the internet never steers us wrong, okay? <laughs> Let's see how this works. Where am I pointing at? Hmm? Okay. Ooh. And this is going to be the longest children's story, too. <laughs> All right, I'll do the cue, the big point. All right. All right, the longest insect. I see it. John Paul, can I just point to you? You see this thing here? Now, it says this is the Chan's Mega Stick. 22 inches long. Can you imagine camping and that thing landing on your face in the middle of the night? Oh, 
Okay, let's go to the next one then. Who thinks they know what the longest animal is? Hmm? Oh, I, oh we're going to get to dinosaurs in a second. Let's see. Let's click it. All right. What do we think this is? Blue whales. So we're not talking inches, but feet. 75 feet long. All right. Can we think of anything longer than that? I heard dinosaurs earlier. So the longest dinosaur. I didn't know this one. What do you think? You got a guess? A what? No. Let's see. Let's see what it is. Oh, my goodness. So this thing is called an Argentinosaurus. 125 feet long. Can we think of anything longer than that? Let's go to the next one. The longest plant. And this includes trees, okay? So that's our clue right there. All right, let's click it and see. Even longer than the dinosaurs, 325 feet of redwood. Somebody knew that one? Let's keep going. The longest bridge in the world. And I think this is in China. Let's see it. 102 miles. This is the Dangang Kushan Grand Bridge. All right. Can we think of anything longer than that? Who thinks they know what the longest river in the world is? Hmm? We should all know this one because what town are we in right now? The Nile? Okay. 4,132 miles. Okay. Last one. You ready for this? Do you know what the longest sermon ever was? Hmm? <laughs> All right. Let's see it. 53 hours. Now, Pastor Alex, this is not a challenge, okay? <laughs> All those people up there used to have black, brown, or blonde hair before the sermon started, and look at them there. So I actually want to show you something that's even longer than these things we were talking about. And in rehearsal, this all came out just very, very smoothly. So we will see. All right. Coming around the corner here. See if this thing will stretch. Do you see what I have in my hand right here? This rope. All right. It's all yellow here, but it's got this black end to it. So this yellow rope goes all the way through the door. Let's click the next slide. This rope is so long that it actually will go all the way through the town of Niles. That's how long it is. So click that slide. You see it kind of going through town here. It's just going off and off. In fact, if you went to Chicago, you could still see this yellow rope around. Let's see the next one. You see that there? It does not stop there either. Did you know that this rope is so long that it keeps going? You could wrap this rope around the moon many, many times, and it will still keep going. So check out, you know what this rope is right here? This is my life right here. And you see this black part right here? How many inches do you think that is? Maybe three, maybe four inches? I heard five. This right here is my life on earth. And guess what, guys? Tomorrow is my birthday. I think I'm getting dangerously close to the halfway point right here. But guess what? There are a lot of people, they have decided that this is the only life that they want to live. But there's a very special thing that we're celebrating this weekend with Easter. And because Jesus has risen, this yellow part here represents our life after this life here on earth. So let's see this last slide here. Each one of you has a rope. You may not be able to see it, but it's there. And you get to make a choice. And you get to look at how long your rope is. And all you have to do is say, Jesus... I accept you, and I love you, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And you have a rope that goes off for infinity. All right, boys and girls, thank you for hearing my story, and you may go back to your seats.
At this time, uh, for, before our congregational prayer, it's our tradition here in Niles, so we do have a prayer box. We invite you to bring home, bring forward any special requests you have or praises, and during the coming week, we will continue to pray for these um, and join you in your own prayers. This time, those are able, let us kneel for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, recognize you as our Creator, our God, and our Savior, Lord. We are so grateful, there are no words to express it. Particularly this time of year, all of the Christian world is, is celebrating the sacrifice in your victory over sin, Lord, that makes it possible to look forward to a victorious life in all eternity spent with you, Lord. It's a mystery that we will spend all eternity trying to understand, but we are so grateful, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made for us. We want to praise you and thank you for the blessings that we've seen um, through the mission trip and the success it was, for protecting those that traveled. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless the people there that have received the buildings. Let that be a hub um, of service to others. And let them know that, that it's your love that will impact the lives down there, Lord. This morning, we have many of us that have special needs. We pray that you would bless those in a special way. Particularly, we think of Max Rusher in the hospital this morning. He suffered a fall this week and, and has a fracture to his neck, Lord. We pray that you would bless him and those that are ministering to him. We also would pray a special blessing on Nancy Rader's family, Lord. She's in hospice care. and and nearing the end of her life here, Lord. We pray that you would comfort the family and, and just help them through this difficult time. I want to thank you for all the other blessings you bestow upon us. Our lives are blessed in so many ways that we will never understand, Lord, but we know that you are a God that's, that's concerned and loves us in every little detail. We like to credit off to, to simply happenstance, Lord, but we know that you have an interest in every little aspect of our lives, Lord. We'd like to give you credit for that. We pray that you continue to bless this school, Lord, in so many ways. Um, it's been such an outreach to our children. We pray that you would continue to bless that effort, Lord. And now we pray that you would bless the pastor in a special way, give him words of encouragement and guidance for us. Help us to be faithful to you through the coming week, Lord, and help us to be sensitive and see the needs of those around us, Lord. So many people have special needs, and it's easy for us to just simply walk on by them, Lord. But Open our eyes so that we can bless those as you would do if you were here. We ask these things in thy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I am very happy to have my niece visiting with us. She's a nursing student at Walla Walla, and um, her break didn't 
um, coincide with our break here at Andrews, but it actually worked out well because we were away for our spring break, so she came to visit, and that was lovely. And of course, I have to task her to uh, share her musical talents with us. And uh, we are going to sing um, a song. It's just called The Weight of the Cross because, of course, that is what we're thinking about as we go into this Easter weekend. The great sacrifice, the great love that God had for us that he sent his son and so that he, uh, that we can be with him and all of us together uh, for eternity in infinity. Oh 
Thank you so much for the special music that prepares our hearts for God's message. And his message is that he died on the cross for our sins, but he is no longer in the grave, for he was raised on the third day, and he promised that one day to come back and take us home. Thank you for the special music. We uh, celebrate, are going to celebrate this weekend uh, the event, of that the fact that Jesus uh, paid with his own life for our salvation and also that he raised from the dead. And I praise uh, God for the decorations that help us understand that. And I encourage you this weekend, please use this as an opportunity to tell those that are near and far how much you appreciate the love of Jesus in your life and what he has done for you and me. Continuing our journey through the Word of God, I would like to share with you from the book of Hosea. And uh, now in his book, Shields of Brass, Roy Angel gives us an illustration of what God's love can do in the life of a despicable human being. And Miss Sadie, that's how everybody in town called her, lived at the edge of a town, and it was despised by most of the townspeople. And when one day two ladies decided to reach out to her, knocked on her door, and invited her to the revival meetings, she was laughing at them. She said, you know what? Even if I uh, come and receive Christ as the Savior, you would never accept me into your church. Uh, she was called the ugly person, and it has nothing to do with her appearance. It was all about the character. Nobody liked her. But the next day, the same ladies came with a similar invitation. Would you please join us at the revival meeting? And she declined the offer, also scornfully. But when next time they showed up with the same request, she now gave up and said, okay, I will attend these meetings with one condition, that I would sit outside the tent somewhere in the darkness, and I would like to hear what the uh, gospel uh, is all about. And as she sat there in the darkness outside the tent, two ladies have joined her, and she was coming for next five consecutive nights and uh, attended there outside the tent. On the sixth night, she decided to come in and would sit in the last row there in the tent. And then was this altar call that the uh, preacher made, and she uh, accepted Jesus as her Savior. The next uh, worship service, everybody saw her coming into the church, and she sat somewhere at the end uh, of a church, somewhere in the back pews over there, and there was a hush in the congregation. That's because uh, how much people did not like her. They did not like the fact that she was there. And finally, when the preacher again made another call, she was coming forward, and a miracle happened. A 19-year-old uh, choir member, a girl, came uh, towards her, gave her a hug, and kissed her in the forehead, and walked uh, all the way, all the rest of the way towards the front with her, supporting her. A lot of tears were there. Some of the people were ashamed for their resentment and uh, not acceptance over people. And I can tell that this lady never missed a church ever since. She was a faithful member, and God made such a transformation with her character that when she died, uh, she drew the largest crowd at her funeral uh, because people were uh, able to see that God, what God can do uh, with a despicable human being. Human, hu uh, humans don't like to work with uh, um, uh, sinners, uh, prostitutes, the ugly, despicable people, but God does. He chooses many such people to join his kingdom, and many of them become first in his kingdom. He judges their sin but changes their lives. He also challenges us to love such people as much as Hosea loved Gomer and as deeply as God loves us. So the title for today is Loving the Ugliest. 
Um, in my uh, message today, I might uh, name Hosea Hosea. That's because uh, how his Hebrew uh, name is read in the Bible, or Hosea. But uh, please forgive me uh, if I switch back and forth. It's the same person. Uh, now, Hosea was a son of Beeri, uh, who is otherwise, uh, his father is unknown. Hosea was apparently from a northern kingdom, and his name means salvation. Hosea's marriage to Gomer, uh, his wife, um, and the naming of his three children was a living illustration for the people of Israel, what it means to be unfaithful to your God. The book can be dated uh, by the southern kings of uh, Uzai, Jotham, and and Ahaz, and even Hezekiah in the southern kingdom. And if we talk about the northern kingdom, his ministry included ministry uh, to kings like Jeroboam II and then uh, the other consecutive kings that finally he met the death of a, a northern kingdom as well with a, a king by the same name, Hosea. Now, his ministry was to, uh, during the time of Jeroboam II, and he was speaking against the rich people that have become rich because of uh, treating unfaithfully and not rightly the poor people. And he was teaching them and instructing them to repent and give their heart to Jesus. And later on, after King Jeroboam, by the way, the most successful king of a northern uh, kingdom, uh, the successive kings did not have much of a, um, uh, of a uh, I would say, success on the throne. Uh, they, uh, some of them were uh, killed, assassinated. Most of them, I would say, were assassinated. And uh, the kingdom was uh, torn apart by Assyrian Empire in uh, 722. Now, uh, the, uh, speaking of uh, the message to uh, the book, um, uh, to, to the people of Israel, you might wonder, why did I reserve the entire week for uh, such a small book as Hosea. I just uh, got only a few chapters, and you know probably we have read some uh, larger books before. But anytime I preach from a book of Hosea, I ask congregation this question. Anytime. Who do you think is the strongest person in the Old Testament? Who do you think is the strongest one? And uh, usually I come up with a different uh, answers from a congregation. Some respond, probably Samson, referring to his physical strength. Somebody would refer King David because he faced Goliath. And uh, uh, somebody would say uh, the mighty man of David. Somebody would say Moses because he led his people out of uh, Egypt land. Somebody would have an opinion that Elijah, because he was the only uh, prophet, as people think, standing um, against Ahab, the uh, rebellious king. But my friends, I do not know stronger person in the Old Testament than Hosea. I don't know a stronger person. Why? All the other people that I mentioned to you already are the heroes of the Bible, and they would stand for their belief. Uh, they would face the uh, crowds of unfaithful people and fearlessly would proclaim the word of God. But Hosea was the one to embrace the ugliest, to embrace something and forgive something that we have hard times forgiving the unfaithfulness. And his wife, Gomer, that's what it was a command from God, that he would marry her. And, uh, and we don't know when in the process she became unfaithful to him uh, before the marriage or after the marriage. We don't know that. We know it happened. And how he reacted to that situation that makes him the stronger person, uh, the strongest person I ever know. And actually, even in the New Testament, I know that only Jesus Christ has more love, compassion, and forgiveness than Hosea does. God speaks in this book as a prosecuting attorney in a case of a divorce, and he's talking to his nation, what you have done to me as much as an unfaithful wife to her, uh, to her husband. You have broken the covenant in between me and you just as much as Gomer uh, did break her covenant with Hosea. And in those days, it was just enough of a formula to 
to pronounce for a final divorce. He could say, Jose could say, she is not my wife and I'm not her husband, and that would end the marriage. That would annihilate that relationship. Unfaithfulness in just uh, case uh, is a just case for the divorce in secular world and in the church. And yet this person finds strength and power within himself to go and find that woman, forgive that woman, and take her back in, uh, into his uh, marriage and family. The Hebrew text that gives the uh, purpose uh, for the name of uh, their children and actually the testimony of their children is a call back for Gomer, uh, for Gomer to repent, to turn her ways around and come back to the family. God's lawsuit is not of an uh, angry husband that is intending to destroy the reputation and life of his wife. God's call is the call of repentance. Do you see what you have done in, uh, unto me? Please turn back from your evil ways and repent. You know, when uh, people get admitted into emergency room, they have different kinds of wounds. And uh, every medical worker knows that the worst are to deal with uh, those that are infectious wounds because they have been neglected for a long time. And as a result of even a small infectious wound, you might lose an arm, a leg, or even your life if you come in for help way too late. If you get a wound and get treated right away, you are not in that much danger as when you neglect that wound, that infectious wound. My friends, the sin of adultery leaves such a wound and a scar in the life of a family forever. And that's why God is appealing to us, please, 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 stay away, stay away from this sin. Because it hurts families, breaks families apart. And in this case with um, uh, with a Hosea, he is portraying that he is the loving God. He is not interested to break entirely relationships with us. What he wants is to restore the relationship in between him and us so that we stay faithful to him all the time. You know, Hosea dealt with the most difficult case as a uh, um, many times, uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, we can see in his marriage, because uh, uh, as uh, they got married, his uh, wife left the family, and uh, he had to go buy her back uh, because she lived an um, ungodly uh, lifestyle. And uh, my friends, uh, unfortunately, I have to confirm that today the sin of adultery is being promoted to unbelievable scale by the TV and media. And um, that's what uh, David uh, Yont in his, uh, um, in his work, The Cost of Adultery, is saying. Uh, this uh, uh, he wrote about 20 years ago, two decades from now. And he said that uh, today uh, um, it is... Uh, um, a, a fact that a person that is not faithful to his uh, spouse uh, spends on average, that's what he said, on average 20 years ago, $26,000 into that illegal relationship. And only 5% uh, of the times is when people, they get married or they commit adultery with. So that is by far a worst investment ever. And we know that. The Bible told us in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, that we are to stay away from that. And the question is, how come then Hosea was able to forgive, unforgivable, to love and embrace the ugliest and come and buy his wife back? My friends, because I think he knew very well the principle of Jesus Christ that he shared with us in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. I will paraphrase that statement that says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to how to remove the speck from your brother's or from your sister's eye. You might wonder, Pastor, what does that have to do with Hosea's situation? My friends, anytime we wake up in the morning, 
we, when we do not choose Jesus Christ as our master and savior, and we get too busy to spend time with him, we do commit a spiritual adultery. Jesus said, if you are not with me, you are against me. And if you do not choose Jesus this morning as your guide, as your master, as your creator and your guide, that is what he called the spiritual adultery. You know, when Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary, he paid a high price for our salvation. And yet, even in that, it's not always enough in our eyes of a sacrifice. And we want something more than that sacrifice. However, my friends, Jesus did everything and beyond what he could do to save us. Amen? That's what we will celebrate as uh, people this weekend. And I encourage you, not only this weekend, but every time you have an opportunity, share with others how loving Jesus Christ is. My friends, we think something like that is not forgivable because we simply don't see our own sin. That is why Hosea realized that his sinfulness before God is something much worse than what his uh, wife's unfaithfulness to him. And that's why, filled with compassion, he would go and buy her back and restore her in their marriage. Sometimes when, I wouldn't say sometimes, most of the times when I reread the book of Hosea, I get sick because I do not understand how you can be asked to do such a thing. But that's because we don't understand the love of God. Well, when I was in undergrad, I was told a story by one of our pastors, because he was, uh, we had some older pastors join a seminary once in a while, share the stories from ministry. And this story is stuck with me for the rest of my life. Uh, a young uh, couple, they were engaged, not married. Uh, they... Uh, um, uh, decided to wait to get married till uh, uh, he completes his mandatory military service. It's two years back in my country. It was like that. It is like that today. And uh, once he comes back from mandatory military service, uh, two years later he finds out that his uh, fiance is pregnant and uh, she was not faithful to him. And um, she's alone. Uh, the person that was involved in that case is uh, absent, is gone. Uh, he uh, uh, told her lies and disappeared. Now, what to do with that baggage? What to do with that stuff? So he calls the pastor. Well, not with a phone, not with a cell phone. He asks for a visit. And they have this serious, difficult conversation. And after a long conversation, the pastor simply asked this young man, do you love her? And he says, yes. Would you like to live with her? And he said, yes. And then he said, that's the only option then for you is to forgive, but in a such a way that never, ever, you would even hint to what, what happened before. Would never go back to remind you of that. Can you do that? And then he took a pause, a deep breath, and then he said, I think I can do that. And they made a beautiful family. He raised uh, um, someone else's child and their own children, and everybody in that community knew them as the best loving couple. That is what the love of God can do. That is what forgiveness of God can do. Do you think it was easy to forgive? It was just something like you can do like that? It was not easy. It takes courage. It takes a lot of strength. That's why I don't know a person stronger than Hosea in the Old Testament. You may say, Pastor, let's say I'm ready to forgive. Let's say I'm ready to make a new start, a new commitment, but the person still lives in sin. And I would say, you are not responsible for the decisions of other people, but God wants that you would live in a land of forgiveness because that land was conquered on the cross of Calvary. 
God wants you to live with a peace of mind, knowing that you have done everything to redeem the relationships. You know, at one point of time when Jesus was here on earth, uh, there was an incident. It's recorded in the book of uh, Mark, in the book of Matthew. Uh, I will specifically refer uh, the one in the book of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. I would read it uh, from verse 10 and below. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need in a what? In a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Tax collectors and sinners were the outcasts of society in the times of Jesus, and they are today. If you doubt that, what would you think if you would see me speaking to somebody on the street that is selling their body? What, I, what, what your thoughts would be? What would you think in your heart? My friends, multiply that by hundreds, thousands of times, and you will get the situation when Jesus came into the same house where those people were. And he was dining with them. He was spending time with them. He was eating with them. But do you know what? The disciples of Jesus didn't go in. They were outside. They chose for themselves up to this point. Too much for me. Can't take it anymore. Why do I know that? Because Pharisees also didn't get in. It was too much for them. They are not supposed to touch the same uh, place that the sinners were in. They were not even supposed to breathe the same air. And this is where they have a conversation, Pharisees and the disciples of Jesus outside of that place while Jesus is inside. And they are saying, why is Jesus eating with his people? And Jesus says, because they know they're sick. They need a healer. I'm here for them. And they thought, oh, good. Question, do you think Pharisees were sick as well? Yeah, they were. Did they know that? They didn't think so. They thought they were righteous. They missed the opportunity to see Jesus as their Savior. Jesus sits with a table at the same table with thieves and the outcasts of a society and the elders of a church keep standing outside of a house not even willing to come in. We have seen this way too many times. And why Jesus is Jesus? Because he loves the people. And he hates the sin. He loves the sinner. He died for the sinner, not for the sin. So that's why all of the people that are trying to marry sin and Jesus, they don't even know what they're talking about. Jesus died to separate us from sin. And when we, in our own hearts, just make your own study and search in your own hearts, if you have bad feelings towards the outcasts, towards people that are so-called sinners, it is probably happening because, as someone said, we tend to dislike people that sin different than we do. Their sin is different than ours. That's why we are holy and they are not. And we would probably judge less other people if we were to see our own sinfulness at the Calvary, at the foot of a cross. That's why the words of Jesus that he spoke, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn from what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And who did Jesus send Pharisees and his disciples to learn from? My friends, I desire mercy and not sacrifice is a direct quote from the book of Hosea. 
Who but Hosea knew what forgiveness and mercy is all about. And that is much more important before God than all of our sacrifices together. Amen. You know, Candria's story, I was able to read this story in one of the uh, Christian sources about what God can do to a human being. And Candria shared a story, a heartbreaking story, how since she was a young child growing in a dysfunctional family, knew nothing but hatred in the family, and then knew all about the abuse, all kinds of abuse as she grew up, she decided to form her lifestyle according to the abuse that was shaping her before. But there was one person in her life that decided, dedicated himself to love this person, Candria. It was Michael, her uh, classmate, and as they graduated, a little bit after that, uh, Candria found herself involved in all kinds of uh, immoral behavior, and uh, this man, Michael, uh, decided to change her life. He came in and proposed her, and he decided to make a family with her, and she thought, well, that's a good way probably to start from the beginning, and maybe that will do away with all of my bad behavior. Do you think it proved right? No, it did not. As they got married, after a little while, she threw herself into the same lifestyle of unfaithfulness. And he found out about that. At that time, he was not even a believer, neither was she was a believer. And for some reason, he dedicated his life to fight for their marriage. And he said, I'm willing to forgive, but we ought to look for some help. And uh, this is a, a miracle happened when one of the hairstylists gave her an invitation to the church. Maybe Jesus can do something about your situation. She got into the church and both of them loved loved to be in the church. They were attending church, and her husband, Michael, instantly accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, and she was ready to do that, but something inside of her heart was still hanging on to that old lifestyle, and she did not commit to Jesus. And as a result, the time went by, she went into the same trait of behavior, being unfaithful to her husband. Of course, nothing like that would be uh, under secret. It was discovered, and she had to confess, and this is when her husband told her, I'm still fighting for you. On my knees, and I tell you, right now, would you please commit yourself to me and be faithful rather than to all of this, your lifestyle. And she spent two dark weeks fighting with her own heart. And she would recall how a devil would come unto her and tell of all of her sins that she committed, how unworthy she was of salvation in Jesus Christ. But finally, after those two dreadful weeks, she made a decision to belong to Jesus and Jesus alone. She gave her heart to Jesus. And as a result... She said, I saw a dream one night, and in that dream, I was standing next to Jesus. I was so proud to be his daughter. And as I'm standing there with Christ, God says, you are now set free. Uh, welcome home. That is a picture I will never, ever forget. That is what God can do in a life of a despicable human being. That's how God can embrace the ugliest. And I, when I say when God can love the ugliest, I have nothing to say about the physical. It is all about our sinfulness. My friends, we are all sinners. And yet God renews his covenant with us every single time we ask. And that's the God we serve. In his book, The Shields of Brass, Roy Angel gives us that illustration I mentioned to you about, about how this woman was the outcast of a society. She lived there far away from people up until somebody decided to reach out to her to tell her of the love of Jesus. And they won her heart for the kingdom of God. And out of darkness... She came into the full light, 
and God has transformed her character to such a degree that when she died, her funeral drew the greatest crowd in the community. My friends, what is the problem that you are dealing with? You think it's big enough that Jesus Christ cannot handle? What is the sin that is heavy enough that Jesus Christ cannot detach from you? What is the problem that you are dealing with time after time, night after night, fall after fall, that you think Jesus is not able to handle? Bring it all to him and check it out. Try him out. You will see there's no stronger person than Jesus Christ that is able to lift us from a depth that we are falling into, into his kingdom. Amen. I invite you all to stand for our last song, number 475. for prayer. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful to you for dying for all of us on the cross of Calvary and buying our salvation with such a high price. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins and forgive us when we judge the sins of others. For at that time we do not know how much we have wronged you. Please help us see how much you love us in your sacrifice. Help us understand your mercy and forgiveness better so that we could explain this beautiful truth about your love with those around us. And help us never to judge, but love those you sent us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.